Dear friends and colleagues, uh, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you uh, to this ce celebratory event. Um, it is great to see so many of you, friends and colleagues. Uh, we are here to uh, launch and celebrate uh, the birth of this wonderful, wonderful object. You know, who reads books any longer? Well, this is a book that's going to make a mark on uh, um, the study of the politics of circulation and uh, reverberate across debates um, on the Horn of Africa and its, uh, its politics. And it's a wonderful uh, collective uh, volume um, that is uh, 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 co-edited by uh, Vince Deputat, who is here in person, and Tobias Hackmann, who uh, unfortunately could not uh, make it. Um, and there's also uh, two of the uh, wonderful um, participating authors uh, to this collective project. And it's my uh, delight to be a uh, host for you today. And um, so, so let me um, introduce, uh, tell you a bit more about the, the uh, participants. I don't think Finn needs an introduction. Um, but for those of you who, who still don't know him, he is uh, uh, our uh, esteemed colleague here at the Danish Institute uh, for International Studies, still. Uh, he uh, has made his mark on uh, debates on state formation, sovereignty, uh, the politics of the living and the dead, and as well as the politics of, of circulation, just to name but, but a few. Um, he's the author of uh, uh, the, the wonderful volume, States of Imagination, and this is um, uh, uh, the book we're celebrating today, uh, Trade Makes States. Uh, then um, uh, uh, we also have with us um, co-authors uh, of the book, Ahmed Moussa, who is a senior researcher at uh, PRIO, um, and uh, if I'm not wrong, also connected to uh, RACO in, uh, in Hargeza, uh, who works on aid, humanitarianism, and uh, informal economic governance in uh, the Somalia, Somali areas. Um, and he, he is a co-author to this, this wonderful book, among many other uh, wonderful publications. And we have uh, Christine Stro Waming, uh, PhD, uh, independent researcher who's also published a lot on uh, taxation, state making, uh, street vendors, and citizenship in Puntland and, and Kenya. Um, and you have also co authored, I believe, two chapters to the current, uh, to the current vol volume. Um, so, what we're going to do is uh, not just um, have a, a talk by Finn, who's going to uh, present the book, but we're also going to have a discussion by, by two discussants. Mm -hmm. We're very lucky to have with us today uh, Jose Maria uh, Munoz, who came all the way from uh, Texas. How's the jet lag? <laughs> um, who is a senior lecturer in African Studies uh, and International Development at the University of Edinburgh. And he works on the governance of trade, uh, business and transport in West Africa the other side of the continent that we'll be looking at today. And he's the author of the wonderful book, Doing Business in Cameroon, uh, An Anatomy of Economic Governance. Um, and then we have with us, uh, none, none less than Vanessa van der Bogaert, a research fellow at the uh, ICTD, the International Center for Tax and Development, and um, uh, a senior research associate at the Monk School of Global Affairs and public policy at the University of Toronto. Uh, she's published very, very extensively on all matters tax, uh, formal and informal, um, state and armed groups in Sierra Leone and Somalia, to name but uh, a few. So what we're going to do today is, uh, first we'll, we'll allow Finn to, to present the book. We have, he has a wonderful presentation that he made. This will take about, um, you know, 15 minutes more or less. Then um, our um, uh, Vanessa and Jose Maria will have time to, to comment on the book. And afterwards, we'll just have a, have a wonderful Q&A session with uh, the authors where you can um, uh, raise your, your questions. Now, of course, you know, uh, there's a bit of politics of circulation involved here as well. The book lies there. It's not free, you know. And in order to make your way out of it, you know, it's just a small nudge to, um, yes. Uh, but we will end the... Uh, uh, session with uh, with the reception and we hope you will stay around to enjoy and celebrate uh, with us afterwards as well. Without further ado, Finn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Can you hear me? <coughs> you can hear me, both with and without mic. Okay, um, <coughs> so this book is a, it's a good example of uh, academic timelines. Uh, ten years ago, Tobias and I applied for the project, for funds for the project behind the book. Um, and uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this project, because that so you can see where the ideas came from and, and where they've been going. So we did the, uh, the, the application for a project called Governing uh, Economic Hubs and Flows in Somali, East Africa. And we got the money. And uh, we were like involving 12 researchers, five different institutions, three in the horn, which was very complicated. And we had to give up two partners and new on board. And we had to prolong the project like two years. So we finished in 19 instead of 17. And... Um, yeah, we had mm, several different uh, research sites, but most interestingly, the, 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 the research question was uh, how is trade and transport organized and with what effects for state formation in Somali areas? So what we came up with some time ago was the answer, trade makes states, which is, of course, a very tentative um <coughs> idea. But it's a uh, it's a good title for uh, for uh, having many citations because you don't have to read the book to uh, to have a, an opinion about what's going on. Anyway, meanwhile, meanwhile we uh, we published fourteen working papers, thirteen articles before this uh, one book came out. Um, so um, on the way, also we uh, or when we uh, set off for the project, we uh, we developed a corridor approach. So that was kind of the methodological approach that we um, we looked at transnational transport and trade corridors in the uh, in the, in the Somali East Africa, and um, in order to focus not only on on kind of national territory, but talk on talk about transnational areas where where the economy is kind of uh, going back and forth. I'm losing my thing here. Sorry. Hmm. Okay. So, sorry. This is why it's always so complicated. There we go. Gla glasses and I'm there. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, the idea was to look at three different corridors, look how trade and transport was organized along those. So we have, oh, we have um, the Barbara Corridor ending in Addis. We have the um, uh, a corridor from the, the port of uh, Busasso and then uh, well into Puntland and further south. And then we have the southern corridor here, the Kismayo or Gadisa cor corridor that ends in, uh, in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, and we talk about, also the title is The Greater Somali Economy, and that, uh, that is, uh, we're riffing on a political project that called The Greater Somalia, which, was, uh, which failed, actually. Said Barre tried to, to make that happen, but it didn't. But economically, and due to the Somali exodus, there's actually both a lot of uh, Somali people who, who kind of migrated or fled to Ethiopia and Kenya and further um, further afield. Uh, and they also brought a lot of capital, not a lot, they brought capital and livestock and, and stuff like that. So that kind of helped energize the, the economy in, in the Somali parts of, of, uh, of Kenya and Ethiopia. So um, that's why we talk about a, a greater, greater Somali economy. <coughs> a bit provocative, maybe. Um, so we looked at, uh, at uh, different commodities in these three, th three corridors, like livestock, vegetables, agricultural products, electronics, um, imported sugar. Jakob, who is here as well, wrote a fantastic working paper on, on the sugar trade or sugar smuggling from Kismayo down, down south and into Kenya which the Kenyan army is very much involved in. Um, also telecommunications and finance and other stuff. So, um, oh, that was the wrong way. Yeah, so the key insights. Um, 
very often Somali, Somalia, Somali areas have been known for being failed state and all this. Uh, but one of the key messages, of course, and we're not, of course, the only one saying this, but, but actually it, it, it's not free of state, it is, there's not no state, but there's actually a lot of competing state projects. Um, so we have um, the federal state, we have the federal member states, we have Somaliland, Puntland, which is like a bit in between, we have Al-Shabaab, and then we have a lot of uh, like, like, the, like local administrations who also think in terms like in a bit in, in stateness terms, also uh, engaged in taxation of trade and so on. Um, <coughs> so that's one of the key messages. And then the other is uh, that governing goods is a key state building strategy. Other theories, they, they focus on land, territory or people, that that's important, but, but we try to point to the circulation of goods as, as a key factor in, in, in state formation. Um, so yeah, the trade taxation is actually very common, but it's also extremely important for the revenue for making a state. You need, a, uh, you need security, you need uh, an administration and so on. And, and actually a, a, a very large part comes from the uh, trade taxation. Um, and then we, we don't talk a, a lot about that, but, but I mean the international community tends to ignore the, this kind of material basis of, of the Somali state, uh, have fiscal reforms, uh, good governance and institution building and so on. But, but we think actually maybe that they should look a bit more into these dynamics. So, a bit about the, say, kind of theoretical um, moorings of, of, of our project. Um, so, the, the theoretical ter uh, terrain that we engage is uh, some borderland literature, critical logistics, and classical state formation literature. Because it's actually very interesting because um, the political dynamics in the Somali territories after 91, uh, they actually conform with some central tenets of classical state formation theory, such as Charles Tilly. And we in particular used not, not the war make states, which as you can understand, we kind of riff on for the title, trade make states. But he has also written uh, like a volume on coercion, capital and European states over a thousand years, that's Tilly. Um, <coughs> so he talks about, um, and, and also others, talked about the relationship between merchants, political rulers and specialists of violence. Um, so the merchants are the, the, the traders and business class, uh, the specialists in violence could be clan militias, warlords, Al-Shabaab, um, who are charging for protection. The merchants, they are looking for protection and predictability in terms of taxation and so on. And then we have the political rulers, or in this case, aspiring state builders, many of them. They're looking for revenue for what Tilly calls war and state making, so against external enemies and internal enemies. Um, <coughs> so therefore, uh, they engage in, in, uh, in raising revenue. So there's, there's something going on around uh, uh, protection for revenue. So revenue is going into protection. Uh, but, but also the revenue basically comes from what Tilly calls payment on flows. So taking this on board, we, um, we added the politic of circulation. Wow, that was interesting. <laughs> it looked nice otherwise, but politics of circulation, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the motion, uh, the, the, the mobility we, we, we put into the, the framework. So um, just to give you a, dif dif like a preliminary uh, definition of what politics of circulation is, and the struggles over the power to influence the movement of commodities, finance and people, as well as the revenues that derive from these movements. So that's kind of a, a concept that goes, runs through the chapters, more or less, more or less. Um, <coughs> so we developed three arguments. Um, 
The first one is that effective state building requires that public administrations and state-like entities balance between the facilitation of commodity flows and the capture of commodity flows. So you have to balance, you have to be sure that actually the flows are running, because otherwise th it will dry up. Uh, but you also have to capture the commodity flows and, and have a revenue from it, tax it, customs, all that. So you also need to slow down these flows. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a balance to strike. So you continue having flows and not uh, capture them too much so that they, they, they stop. Um, yeah, so, so that, that means, uh, for example, eliminating competition from other rent seekers, like other people who do roadblocks, for example. Um, so, so kind of uh, reducing the transaction cost for traders is, is, is an important thing, but also standardize and routinize circulation and taxation. Um, and engage in gatekeeping, as Cooper calls it, um, for economic rents establishing choke and, and checkpoints, for example, by providing infrastructure like ports and roads. The second argument, coming in now, the multiplication of state-like entities increases friction in commodity flows, but allows traders to hitch between different customs and taxation regimes. So with the proliferation of state projects in, in Somali areas, Traders and transporters, they actually they have to pay a lot of rent on the way, a lot of taxation, a lot of fees here and there. And that, that of course, um, that, that gives a lot of friction and, and increases the, 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 the price of the products and so on. Um, <coughs> so, so there is this competition over revenue between federal member states, the federal state, Somaliland, local administrations and Al-Shabaab. All wants a, a piece of the cake. So more states, more friction. Uh, but then the traders, to the extent that the infrastructure allows it, uh, they will kind of figure out what's what's what are the kind of the best ways of taking your 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 commodities. The third argument, um, and there are only three is that the materiality of traded commodities shapes their state effects as well as their governance. So basically all goods are not created equal. So for example, the, the, the attention of state institutions uh, differs between different kinds of goods di with different materialities. If they are durable or perishable, like the, the chat, the cut import from Ethiopia and Kenya has to go very fast because they, they perish. So the, the negotiation, uh, it, it's, it's very stressful to be a, a, a custom officer at the, at the border to Somaliland because they have to deliver before two o'clock in, in the afternoon and so on. <coughs> um, also, if it's high or low value goods, like chat again is very high, low va high value, livestock is high value, but also uh, like, like grain is, is it's heavy, it's durable and it's low value. So that there's not that much interest in, in taxing that. Then also, is it easy or difficult to capture? So the difference between truck livestock, for example, that comes along the road, that depends on the roads, and, uh, and, and tracked livestock, tra livestock on the hoof, which is much more difficult to, to capture. OK, so that was the arguments. Now I'll just run through the, the chapters of the book, so you can have an idea of what's in there. Um, so apart from the introduction, which I more or less have given you now, um, can I find my notes here? Yeah. Trust as social infrastructure in Somali trading networks by Neil Carrier and Hannah Elliott. Um, they give an analysis of trust explained as a normative discourse that lubricates the circulation of capital and goods, even though trusting is still risky business. So it's kind of trust as productive uh, of, of, of relations, but it, 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 it doesn't mean that people always can trust each other. That I think that's a, their that's a point. So the next chapter by uh, Gianluca Giasolino and, and uh, Nicole Stremlau on war, peace, and the circulation of mobile money across the Somali territories. 
which is basically looking at the technical and financial infrastructure of circulation. So the chapter gives us uh, a story, the story of the digital finance and telecommunication in Somali areas, which is very advanced. Um, they develop from remittance companies to mobile money systems and mobile banking and so on. And com companies like uh, Hormut here, is, is, uh, th they have become huge conglomerates, which are key actors in the politics of circulation in different ways. So the fourth chapter, the rev revival of re and re-embedding of Somali ports uh, by a lot of people. Um, basically, this is a, 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 a photo from some time ago of uh, Barbara Port. You see some of the ships that was uh, that were stuck there during the war. So uh, basically, we we uh, we claim that that uh, that ports have been a decisive asset in the politics of circulation and of state formation uh, after the Somali state collapse. Um, the chapter looks at the recent history of four different Somali ports. So Kismayo in South, Mogadishu, uh, Busasu in Puntland, and uh, Berba in, in Somaliland. Um, and then we focus on uh, Berba port, which since 2017, 18, have been through an, a process of upgrading, financed by DP World, which is a, a huge uh, port operator and logistics operator from Dubai, um, which have kind of taken over the port. So, <coughs> um, we argue that, that the, the upgrading uh, actually disembeds the port from the its kind of its local moorings, the social relations, social economic relations locally, and re embeds the port in, in a new kind of network um, that give more control of course to DP World, but also to the central Somali land government vis a vis the, the, the local um, uh, sub clans there. So yeah, this is from sorry. This this is from 2015, and that's from 2019. So that's some of the things that has that has happened. This was the port that basically financed uh, Somaliland as a as a kind of de facto state. So in that sense, as Somaliland is probably the best example of of our theory. <coughs> the others are as Jethro. Uh, Norman, one of my colleagues, said when he read the first version of the introduction, say, yeah, trade makes states sometimes, somewhere, maybe. Anyway, it's out there. Um, where did we get to? Oh, yeah, the marketplaces. Christine? Okay. Um, so this is uh, the fifth chapter, uh, which uh, concerns itself with the uh, marketplaces and um, the regulation of, of uh, marketplaces as key sites of circulation, um, where the commodities and the flows of money and commodities slow down and accumulate and become visible, and uh, therefore they become uh, the marketplaces become an opportunity for authorities uh, for regulation and extraction. And this chapter shows how uh, some of the different marketplace dynamics that are found in the different marketplaces throughout uh, Somali East Africa, uh, and how those market dynamics depend on uh, commodity and commodities and value chains and their materiality, the geographical location and population movements, infrastructure and logistical networks, uh, avail available services and protection of goods and the mechanisms for conflict mediation and enforcement of contracts. Um, so it basically shows how the politics of circulation is uh, formed through interactions in the marketplaces where everyday operations and various forms of organization challenge and produce public authority. Thank you. And here to the right, you see our my co-editor, Tobias Hackman, uh, enjoying a market. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. There we go. So the next chapter is uh, on governing commodity flows in the Somali borderlands by Asnake Kefale. 
from uh, Addis Ababa University and Jakob Rasmussen, who's here somewhere. Um, this is this is a truck in uh, in in Bavra Port. You see, it has two um, two number plates, one from Ethiopia and one from Somaliland. So that's the kind of the conditions when you go do trans uh, transnational uh, trading there. And and the other one is a, it's a chat uh, express from Ethiopia to Somaliland. Um, basically, um, yeah, this chapter compares two cross-border corridors to Kenya and to Ethiopia, the, the, the southern and the northern one I showed you. Show the shifting roles of authorities in regulating, facilitating, and interrupting the circulation of goods. I think one of the one of the points uh, of, of the chapter is that they point to the role of traders and other specialists in maintaining the flow of goods. Like the flow is very important. Um, so, and they often got, get stuck with all this friction on the way, mm, different kinds of friction. So the the task is to re releasing the goods when they encounter friction and putting the goods back in circulation. So Jacob has this image of of the the trader sitting in his or her office in Eastleigh in Nairobi with a phone ready to mobilize networks and contacts and so on to, to have the goods released. Um, which is very, they, it's, really, it's really ingrained this kind of eagerness to keep things flowing. That, that's where the money comes from. Um, so the next chapter is Ahmed's and taxation, raising fiscal revenues. And um, thanks, Finn. Then, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a bit intimidating to talk to a large audience of curious academics. So, uh, I mean, this uh, chapter seven is raising physical revenues that the political economy of Somali and uh, uh, Somali trade taxation. And uh, the chapter uh, tries to answer uh, two main questions. Uh, which are, for example, what authorities of tax, uh, I mean, are taxing Somali trade. So we are try to, just trying to map uh, different actors, different authorities, national, subnational, local government, state, non-state, uh, legal, non-legal actors who are taxing the Somali economy, and also how, uh, how, when do they tax, and how do they tax, and where do they tax, and so on and so forth. And the second question was, how does trade taxation relate to politics of circulation, the concept that Finn has, has, has elaborated. So we are mainly looking at uh, the, the relationship between the taxing authorities and the, the taxi payers or the Somali, Somali traders. And what uh, the different types of taxation and the relationship between different types of taxation and uh, what we call uh, uh, taxi games. Instead of using taxi, tax, taxi, uh, social contract, which is a, a concept that uh, many Europeans know and understand, in the Somali context, we 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 rather prefer to use the concept of taxi games, where there's a whole game of uh, avoidance in negotiation. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. And then uh, the chapter. Uh, Contribute to the uh, I mean limited literature on uh, Somali uh, trade taxation, and uh, as as Finn, as you have mentioned, it, the Somali economy is understood as unregulated, untaxed, but we try to counter argue that 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 that, that kind of uh, I mean understanding, and we we prove uh, with empirical evidence that Somali economy is taxed. Uh, in fact, taxed by many actors, state, non-state, uh, national level, uh, I mean, federal member states, and so on and so forth, sometimes competing, sometimes overlapping, overlapping, uh, overlapping actors. Uh, then, in terms of, uh, in terms of taxation, we, we try to use two different lenses, the administrative function of taxes and the formative function of taxes. Administrative in, I mean, service delivery, payment of salaries, and so on and so forth. And but also there is a normative, I mean, formative function of taxes. In other words, the 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 social contract and how the tax shapes the relationship between the taxi payers, in other words, Somali traders, and the taxing authorities. Those multiple national, subnational, subnational actors. And finally, uh, let me see. The chapter has. Uh, That's why I said you're going to intimidate me. 
So in terms of the sections, finally, the chapter has th four, four sections. Number one, the first section looks at taxing actors, states, uh, local governments, security uh, agencies, I mean security apparatus, and then state actors like Al-Shabaab. So those are the taxing authorities. The, there's also a chapter on uh, the taxi games, negotiation, avoidance, protest, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. There's also a section on taxing the relationship between how the, the, the taxation influences the relationship between the taxing authorities and the taxi, and the taxi payers. And the final section is about making and making, how taxi makes or and makes the state. So pr precisely that's what the, an overview of the chapter, back to you. Thank you. I should mention that the, the, the map is, uh, is actually up here and uh, up the Raman's uh, work. It's a map of roadblocks in, in particular in, in South Central Somalia. Um, so, um, the, actually the concluding uh, chapter takes, uh, takes us into this, uh, makes it a bit more profound uh, and try to apply this uh, TILIS framework to different Somali state projects. Uh, like Somaliland, Puntland, the federal state, and Al Shabaab. So it's about coercion versus capital intensive state formation, uh, different state making activities, and so on. So, in this optic, uh, the, let's say existing statehood in the Somali areas resembles a kind of a federation of city states or trading states more than like a, a, a national state. So, maybe this was a way of thinking about what was going on. So we also give examples of how trade and business have played directly into state formation and how the politics of circulation have contributed to state formation both by providing revenue, which is very important, but also by introducing international standards uh, in logistics, customs, airports, infrastructure and even tele telecommunication, where they now have to live up to certain, certain standards, which is basically creating state institutions, state capacities and so on. Anyway, last chapter, uh, the afterword, we asked Peter, Peter Little, who in 2003 published this book, Somalia, Economy Without a State. It's not his title, he said, um, but it's, uh, again, it's one that you get a lot of quotes for, for that. Um, but of course, um <coughs> apart from some nice words, he's, he points to some of the, the gaps in the book. Now, I don't want to take the word from you, but, but he says uh, that the, the federal state project is the elephant in the room. We don't really engage with whether it's good or bad or anything. We don't have a normative approach. We do talk about uh, inequality and so on. But uh, his question is, is it, a, is it a good and just kind of state that emerged when trade makes states? And then the gender question, which is more or less absent. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's it. That was only a bit over time. Wonderful, Finn. Thank you so, so much. Um, so who of you would like to start? The program says Jose Maria. All right. Okay, uh, I'll also try to keep it brief so that we, we have time for a uh, discussion. Is it working now? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I mean, t as you can imagine, to be invited to, to engage with the scholarly outputs of, of researchers whom one has never met in person is a rare occasion in these academic lives uh, we lead, no? So I don't take it for granted. Uh, um, and if you add to that the fact that uh, it, it is a book about uh, a region in the African continent I'm not a specialist in, uh, you can uh, get a, an additional sense of, of how happy I am to, to be here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real treat. Um, and um, I guess um, having, having read the book, uh, as, a, as a grateful reader, uh, my, my main task should be one of uh, Mm, conveying the enthusiasm, you know, it, this is something you should definitely read. So, don't don't miss uh, the opportunity if if you have the time. 
uh, regardless of whether you are particularly interested in, in, uh, in the Horn of, of Africa or, or not. Uh, um, I guess part of this enthusiasm uh, has to do with, with my own research interests, uh, having uh, written a whole book which tried to to identify circulation and specifically the negotiation of, of the passage of goods and people as, as the key trope that dominated discussions about the economy in northern Cameroon, uh, you can see that this kind of falls closely um, um, alongside those interests. Uh, but um, I mean, this is only part of, of, of why I, I lo like the book so much. And, and, and it is those qualities, perhaps, that, that I, I wanted to emphasize. I mean, some of them are obvious from what uh, Finn and, and the, uh, the co-authors present here have said. Uh, but you know, it worth, it's worth uh, reminding us uh, what some of those qualities are. No? The, cause it's rare to also uh, find a, a multidisciplinary and multi-sided uh, project like this one um, that's so well informed and, and so empirically rich at the same time than you know, having uh, theoretical aspirations uh, that are articulated qu quite uh, quite clearly um, and um, mm, as, as is apparent uh, from the presentation these are not easy places to to work in no. uh, so I guess uh, it, it, it is something that makes it uh, particularly precious uh, um, there is also an aspect of it that that is remarkable in terms of, of how genuine and fruitful the collaboration has been no the I guess um, it is something that uh, Somali studies have suffered a lot from, uh, this kind of outsiders that, that take the lead in representing uh, the, the realities of, of this part of the world. Uh, whereas here we have uh, a clear collaboration between uh, scholars based in, in the Horn of Africa and East Africa more generally and, and uh, researchers based in, in Europe. And, and this is not easy to pull off and I'm sure Finn has a lot of, of anecdotes uh, about the the institutional complexities to begin with and the amount of energy this, this involves uh, to kind of create the conditions for a research collaboration uh, along these lines. Uh, and I guess the, the last quality I, I want to emphasize in this sort of uh, prefatory remarks is, is really the cohesiveness of, of the whole. Uh, it's kind of, we are all <laughs> probably exposed often to these uh, edit co edited collections that, that are really yeah, putting together rather disparate contributions, where uh, here there, there's a genuine effort to, to, to think collectively about um, some of the aspects that each uh, chapter illuminates. So again, uh, things that we may take for granted, but they make this, this particular book uh, uh, exceptional, I think, in, in many regards. Um, I, I don't want to you know, go through all the aspects and the richness of, of some of the chapters you've, you've been uh, since summarized, uh, I guess for all, for readers also not very familiar with the Somali territories, uh, uh, you will find here really kind of rich analysis of phenomena like you know the the Somali enclave in Nairobi, Eastly that that has been mentioned, or or the role of this uh, telecommunications uh, revolution also. Uh, with with the aspect of, of digital financial services that in some ways make make uh, Somalia and and the Somali territories um, particularly singular. Um, it's kind of a, a last point, perhaps, is also to to say that um, it, it it is very easy to pathologize and exoticize. Uh, the, the Somali uh, uh, territories, uh, and and I was reminded of this uh, not that long ago. Uh, uh, I've been spending the year in in Washington D.C. and and there was this World Bank event on on uh, transport. And they they do like a big uh, conference of policymakers and and uh, government representatives on on transport policy in Africa. It's quite a, you know uh, an, an ethnographic experience uh, to to attend one of these. I've, I've been to a few. Uh, and 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 there in in one of these sort of government officials uh, panels uh, i i came across the 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 somalia minister of of transport uh, and not that you should have very high expectations of ministers uh, talking in a world bank event anyway you know the, but uh, but let's say that she lived up to the lowest expectations you can have uh, uh, about uh, 
about uh, Somalia. So in a way, you know, just uh, sharing the reaction of the public uh, to, to what the minister uh, did was, was in a way kind of seeding uh, to this temptation of, of seeing Somalia as, as kind of this hopeless case that, that uh, leads to, to pessimism. You know? And uh, I guess uh, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things he was saying, you know, the it, it was mostly about um, how how what was missing was more money, and and how you know they 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 wanted all the capacity that the World Bank could provide. So to kind of this, it's very sort of disappointing ideas about l like imported expertise and and articulating a lack of of a proper. Vi uh, own uh, vision of, of how things should be, um, and and I guess at some point the the master of ceremonies gave also each of the of the presenters the opportunity to ask a question to the other presenters, and and I, the minister used the opportunity to to tell the World Bank uh, representative what is it what was it that Somalia was doing wrong and, and uh, how could they fix it? You know, the, so you know you you see these almost servile sort of. Uh, um, talking to to international organization representatives of course these things are quite complex uh, and 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 you could also read it as a way of putting the world bank uh, representatives on, on the spot no and and kind of uh, making perhaps commitments on a public stage uh, uh, it's kind of not to make a lot out of this but i guess uh, my point was that uh, even in in this kind of highly visible public settings uh, ideas about the, the pathologies of Somalia are reproduced, and and uh, this this is one of the reasons why uh, research like this is is particularly timely and and necessary. Um, I I could uh, say a lot of things about <laughs> the contents of the books. Uh, uh, I think Vanessa is going to touch more on on something that interests me uh, a lot. Also, the the, the the taxation aspect of of the of the research project. Um, I will perhaps say a few things about something that I particularly enjoyed is, is this chapter on, on ports um, uh, and particularly the, the focus on the Berbera port <laughs> and it's, it's really one of these uh, um, cases where you see uh, what perhaps academic uh, um, figures can contribute to, to kind of debates the, that are uh, somewhat... Uh, um, Overridden by technical uh, approaches, and and you know I've, I have myself spent s seven years in a project on transport corridors in in West Central Africa, so I can tell you I've read a lot of uh, really dry and disembodied reports by by transport geographers and economists, and and kind of this focus on improving sort of efficiency, logistical efficiency in particular, and 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 it's kind of a deadening uh, type of experience uh, the moment you've read you know a dozen of of these and. Uh, they are always very similar, and and I guess uh, what what the, the researchers of the GovC team have have managed to do here is is to tell a story, um, also kind of uh, greatly enhanced by the use of some uh, vignettes of, of of how some of these actors um, shaping how the port operates uh, uh, act and in practice, but uh, placing uh, the story of of those four ports. Uh, Within also a broader regional context, but uh, with a, a kind of long enough view uh, that that we see how some of these infrastructural projects uh, have have their own uh, uh, stories, and and uh, it is a particularly eloquent case of of how uh, um, an infrastructure that was uh, localized in in particular local power dynamics and and the role of one of the clans in Somaliland uh, in in managing the port kind of how that gave way in a, in a rather sort of fluid and, and also in some ways uh, um, contingent way to uh, a, a moment in which we have uh, these uh, multinational uh, operators uh, like the Dubai uh, uh, World Ports uh, uh, present, not only in, in Somalia uh, and in Somaliland, but also in, in Djibouti and... and uh, Alongside many other port operators in the region, so that you you have here a fantastic example of how this um, notion of, of port competition is actually making uh, different polities and, and authorities uh, 
uh, engage in, in, in commitments that sometimes are not very easily reversible. No? You, once you have a, a very expensive deep water port uh, and, and then you don't have cargo, uh, you realize that, that perhaps you, know, the, you, you have been overly optimistic. And, and I guess they, they sketch some the possibility of some of these scenarios in, in uh, 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 the, these Somali territories. I've been a bit lengthier than I expected, uh, so uh, a last word to say that uh, and the, the last chapter, the, this uh, Chile in the tropics, is, is one of these examples of, of how intellectual sophistication is, is not incompatible with clarity. And, and uh, if you start the book by the introduction and, and that uh, concluding chapter, you will really appreciate the, the way in which the, the, the intellectual intervention is, is really... Uh, mm, articulated in in uh, in a very sort of reader friendly way that that is uh, boding well for the success of the book thank you okay great thank you can everyone hear me better Okay, cool. Um, so thank you so much. I mean, it's really exciting uh, to see, first of all, the book in print, but to be able to be here today to discuss it with some of the, some of the authors. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really brilliant contribution to our understanding of, of historic and contemporary uh, state formation and state building that I think has a lot of relevance beyond Somalia. Uh, and I think it really usefully provides a theoretical framework for um, uh, within which we can start to situate some of the discussions that we've been having over the last two days here on our uh, a workshop that we've been having on the politics of, of roadblocks and revenues. Uh, it, it really, I think, allows us um, that sort of, uh, that underpinning to think about how these tools of, of resource extraction, of regulation and governance uh, shape not just the geographies of conflict, but also uh, the nature of public authority uh, and the possibilities for, for polities and states that, that can emerge. Um, so I want to I want to highlight today three uh, key contributions of the book that I particularly uh, appreciated. Uh, thinking in particular about lessons uh, for all of the researchers in the room, focused uh, especially on uh, the politics of roadblocks and circulation and the politics of of taxation and informal taxation, particularly in contexts uh, where a plurality of public authority uh, I is the is the norm. Uh, so first, I, th I think the book uh, gives, I mean, f it gives a very nuanced approach, not just to the concept of the state and, and the idea of, of statehood, uh, but, but really towards the making and, and unmaking of states. Uh, so again, it, it provides this really nice theoretical framework to understand some of the pathways uh, through which trade and related infrastructure uh, can or cannot uh, lead to, to state authority. Uh, and they identify three pathways uh, in particular. You know, first, and perhaps uh, most obviously, uh, thinking about uh, the role of revenue from, from taxing trade uh, and the ways that that enables uh, greater capacity to govern. Uh, but also they look at uh, how the regulation of trade uh, projects stateness, uh, but can also play a role in imposing or reinforcing or projecting ideology by determining what's allowed or disallowed by what's taxed at a higher or lower rate or not taxed at all. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the con control over trade in this way can, can be central to uh, legitimacy building for, for uh, states or would-be state builders, uh, shaping uh, governing relation relationships with, with local communities and with business actors, but also uh, with external actors. So thinking about bilateral trading partners or international NGOs and all of these relationships can really reinforce uh, notions of, of authority and legitimacy. Uh, and as Finn, as Finn pointed out, the book also really makes clear that different types of goods and trade uh, have different state effects. And I think that that's really important in thinking about, um, you know, how that can help us to understand variation in the, in the nature and, and outcomes of, of states that emerge. Um, they really take in... in, in um, thinking about uh, state building and state formation, they, they take th this approach of, of trying to understand real governance and, and power relationships. Uh, and I think that in turn helps us to understand why uh, externally driven technocratic state building projects uh, create nothing more than a tenuous sense of authority uh, because it's authority that's not grounded in these underlying logics of, of power and legitimacy. Uh, second, I think the book uh, really provides a, a nice grounding for understanding 
the ways in which the control and management of the circulation of goods and people uh, shapes relationships with communities. Uh, so again, Finn highlighted uh, the this uh, central tension that exists for for would be state builders uh, between revenue extraction and and trade facilitation. Uh, which has implications for for gaining and maintaining the support of of local communities. Uh, you know, it really makes clear, and through through some of the chapters, including including Ahmed's, that uh, it makes clear that you you can't uh, you can't tax too much, you can't push too hard, uh, and there may be a need then uh, for for authorities to fulfill expectations of local communities to respond to concerns about fairness, uh, and especially about predictability and and stability for for business interests. So it's through those processes of, of bargaining and negotiation of service provision in, in some instances uh, that we can see examples of, of moral economies emerging, of potentially you know, kernels of a fiscal social contract emerging or, or what, uh, what they describe as these taxing games. Um, you know, trust is described in the book as, as a necessary piece of social infrastructure to facilitate trade and exchange in contexts where there is uh, where there are weak uh, formal state institutions but it also really shows that trust with communities and with with business partners business interests uh, is also really necessary for authorities to maintain their their infrastructural power uh, and third the final point that, that I want to make is that um, I think the book really makes clear that the nature of taxation in this relationship with communities uh, shapes not just whether a state-like structure can emerge, but also what that structure looks like, with what, what is the nature of the polity that emerges. Uh, in the context of, of trade and the types of, of taxes and the types of concessions and exemptions that are given, have implications, I think, first, first for uh, whether the polity that emerges is based on, on broad or narrow interests. Uh, you know, political interest and in, or constituencies can be uh, supported or undermined uh, through the control and, and, and taxation of trade. Uh, and we can see that where economic power is highly concentrated, uh, a, a narrower, a narrower or, or more exclusive political settlement may emerge and that has particular impacts uh, on the economy and on economic incentives. I think it also has implications though for uh, the institutional or bureaucratic capacity of the state that emerges. I, if we have a high reliance on trade taxes rather than uh, broader base forms of taxation, uh, this can imply uh, less of the positive secondary institutional uh, institution building effects that are that are theorized to follow from taxation. Now, I think that you know those are those are open questions, but I think the book uh, provides the framework that can help us to understand variation in the types of polities that emerge across contexts. Again, thinking beyond Somalia um, and the ways in which these are shaped by by trade and related revenues. Uh, so, so overall, I mean, I think the book really provides uh, a really useful lens through which we can understand uh, contemporary statehood and state building dynamics. And, and, you know, it really usefully gives us this very parsimonious theoretical framework through which we can start to make sense some of some of the complexities and nuances in the politics of roadblocks and, and taxation uh, across diverse contexts. So I think we all owe, owe a debt of gratitude to you and uh, thank you for, for the work. Wonderful, thank you so much to you, to the two of you. So, so for the remainder of the uh, time before the drinks, um, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to um, engage with the authors, ask them questions. Oh, yes. I will take a couple, yes, there you go. Could you also please introduce yourself for the... Uh, my name is uh, Sarojuddin Yisar. I've come uh, from, originally from Afghanistan. I did a PhD on the political economy of taxation, but in the context of Afghanistan, and I see a lot of similarities between the kind of context you guys have provided and fantastic presentation. And I'm so much interested, interested to read the book. And uh, the, I've got two uh, kind of uh, theoretical uh, literature related type of questions. The first one goes to uh, Finn, and because you've been talking about Tilly, about these uh, war makes state, state makes war, and, and we have got relevant literature 
about the capital coercion, legitimacy, these sort of things of his core argument about the context of the Western European state formation. And then we have got the new literature about the state building as opposed to state formation. And now the conscious process of building institution as opposed to the unconscious process of state uh, formation. So my question to you is how do you differentiate? Why did you not choose one of those two dominant literature and state building literature? Why you say state making and how do you differentiate when you say state making as opposed to state building and state formation given that historical literature and of course the contemporary literature. And then my second question is to my friend Ahmed. We had good discussion. I didn't know you wrote this chapter otherwise we had a we could have had the discussion. So the, the argument you had about the taxing games is very much to me similar to tax bargaining that we use a lot instead of the social contract theory. And then you have also argued that state tax makes state and tax and makes state. I would like some expansion of those two. How particularly tax and makes the state? Because we say tax contributes to order, tax contributes to disorder. Is that the same thing? Thank you. I'm happy to collect a few more questions for the panel, yes. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. I thought it was fascinating, so congratulations for the book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. I will go back to Tilly because I think that Tilly, I mean, Tilly's theory is far more complex than the caricature that's usually sort of portrayed about or make state, state and, and, and state making. And, and I really like the way you use uh, the patterns of capital accumulation, which is key to his argument about how different types of states are formed. Now, there's one element in, 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 in Tilly himself uh, that it's obviously the lenders and the role that lenders and the, and the emerging bourgeoisie and financial capital have in uh, creating war. So in his model, okay, uh, it, war not only created uh, states, but it also led to capital accumulation. That was more or less the, the full circle. Now, uh, the model has come under serious criticism in Latin America, in Africa, uh, because of, the, of, of, of how applicable it is to con context outside of Western Europe, and it's been subject to crit criticism in Western Europe as well. You know, I've been accused of cherry picking and all that. But still, I think it provides a very, a very interesting model. But for instance, uh, in the case of Latin America, Centeno says that uh, because of difficulties in capital accumulation, you know, wars did not create states, but they actually created blood and debt. You know, very destructive words and a lot of debt as opposed to capital accumulation. My question is, here you're talking about trade creating states. To what extent there's a link between trade and the war economy? And to what extent the war economy it's preventing the emergence or centralization of the state in this case. And so to what extent trade indirectly is also on making the state and not just making it. So that would be my question. You have two wonderful, short, easy to answer questions. So <laughs> I'm looking for a third candidate, you know, something, something of the same ilk. One more question. Yes. Yeah, uh, Joachim Gondel, um, I've been working on and in Somalia for the past 20 years, uh, traveling basically in all these places. I've been in Kismaya, seen the sugar trade, been off, the sugar been offloaded, uh, seen all the transport corridors, uh, everywhere. And I've been doing quite a lot of studies on, for the World Bank in, on, on corruption, on the political economy of the, of the states, etc. And, um, uh, what comes a little bit to to mind, I mean, is I mean, how do you actually? Now it's a very general presentation that you made, so I really look forward to actually look in the book. But you know, w w how would you actually pin down? How how does this actually affect state making and what states? So what kind of states we are talking about? Yeah, because if it comes down to taxation, for instance, who are the most efficient? Uh, uh, tax collectors in Somalia, in South Central Somalia in particular, is Al Shabaab. I mean, they <laughs> they they are beyond, and, uh, and and the infiltration into the existing so-called state uh, uh, structure that is there. If you look into institutions and that, what the international community is looking at, 
uh, they infiltrated all the way along. Yeah, I've been recently the recent year I've been looking into the political economy of the justice sector, and uh, here we have another interesting aspect which reflects, I guess, all the institutions. Yes, you collect taxes. You know, they collect revenue from airports, from uh, the transporters, from uh, 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 the livestock trade, etc. Yeah, uh, but where does it go? And what happens with the money? Right? Uh, when the World Bank goes in and provides a debt relief, I made a study of that together with the London School of Economics and the Conflict Research Program. Uh, there's one side that they practically don't uh, uh, look into is how are budgets made? How is the money actually being spent and what for? And if you look at it, it's actually only ministry staff. There's no implementation, there's actually no work being done, there's no uh, 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 procurement of materials, uh, they're not implementing anything, right? So what kind of state is that? Yeah, uh, uh, that, that actually barely in the political system does not really have any interest in actually broadcasting the state, yeah? And in brackets, and just one second, yeah? Uh, I think it's Jeffrey Herbst who wrote a really, really interesting book on Africa. Uh, using Charles Tilly and making a comparison with Charles Tilly. I don't remember the title, but where he's really talking about the difference also between the European experience and African experience, you know, where, where he, he talks about territory and, uh, and, uh, and, and borders and the lack of broadcast, and there's historical reasons for why there's a lack of broadcast of state power and interest in doing that in the African context, unlike the European uh, uh, context and actually arguing that actually it's Europe that is the historical exception <laughs> in, 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 in history. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, what, what, what is it? Our state in which we are projecting to the rest of the world is actually a particular type of, of governance, of I if you like. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. We have one last uh, question for now on the list. Then we give uh, the, the panel some opportunity to... Uh, my name is Ahmed and I'm a member of the City Council in Copenhagen. Uh, I've been living in Denmark for a long time. And in fact, uh, it is very nice, interesting to read the book. I didn't read it in, uh, now, but uh, I'm interested to read it. You know, uh, Somalia was uh, stateless for many years, but I have been in Somalia for one year ago. Uh, Somalia is improving. There's a corruption, but not as you explain. There's a lot of uh, interference in Somalia. Uh, there's a Ethiopia is 100 million from that side and Kenya, and all this is a, is a, is a conflict. And Somalia is located also. It's a, um, it's a strategic area. But what I've, I was missing in, in, in this book is. What about the diaspora role? So we are sending a lot of money to Somalia. Without diaspora, Somalia will never exist. So I was expecting to you, you add the diaspora role uh, to the book. So we, we I, I feel I'm, 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 I'm part of the state formation in Somalia because I was sending a lot of money to, to my family and all that money was circulating to uh, in Somali economic, so and even the you know the remittance Hawala, we send uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. There's a, we send a lot of money to Somalia, and there's a lot of investment through uh, remittance. So, so, but so if I can summarize it, but, but th thank you for 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 your efforts, and I'm interesting to read the book. All right. Good luck. <laughs> uh, Finn, I think you should uh, start. I should say something? <coughs> okay. Cherry pick. Um, <laughs> I, I first, I should say I'm not the Somali expert um, in, in the editorial team. It's, it's Tobias. Uh, I'm actually a Latin American. It's gone, gone wrong somewhere. Um, but apart from that, um, yeah, the question on state building, state making, state formation. Um, I'm not. W we don't make a big point about 
the why we mostly use the state making concept, but I think state building is very much has become part of the the kind of international jargon. Um, so so I I try to keep a bit away from that. Um, and state formation, I take as a much more like a like a historical long durée historical process. State making is much more like like active engagement by mainly like 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 local actors. Um, so I would say that that's more or less how we distinguish these different um, concepts. It's not entirely systematic, I, I have to um, say. Uh, about the war makes states, um, yeah, that I mean that has more or less been refuted for in 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 um, in relation to 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 Africa, not least uh, that under the current conditions that that doesn't work. On the contrary, um, <coughs> that there is a, a, I mean, trade obviously uh, feeds into the to the war economy, and 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 as as. Pia and ma many others can can testify to it. Um, a, a lot of Al Shabaab's uh, revenue comes from from trade, most of it, probably. Um, <coughs> so it, it's say it's more like the competition between different state projects that that is um, kind of uh, producing the destruction. Um, but of course, I mean, m a lot of the, the businessmen and traders and so on, I and mean they they contribute to both sides. Also, the, the the telecom uh, giants. They they also. I mean, they they obviously pay, <coughs> so they can keep their their towers and and whatnot. Uh, but it's kind of an, a negotiation because if Al Shabaab also need the the internet, uh, of course, to operate and so on. So it's a, there's some negotiation going on there. Um <coughs> uh, yeah. What else? Um, yeah, a, a country like or a, a place like Somaliland is like more than. When I when we started working there, it was like 50 percent of the of the annual budget that went into security, and and you can see now well, there's the problems in in, in 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 part of Somaliland, or the, the disputed part of in Lassano, um <coughs> where you now see the, the the security forces being much more actively uh, deployed and so on, uh, which of course also has to do with with the, the trade derived revenue. Oh, Joachim, I think you should uh, you should give us a presentation instead of, of me trying to say stuff here. Um, um, I think I think yeah yeah we should invite you. Um, the the yeah the lack of interest in in projecting the state. I think, I mean th I I think that that that's very spot on actually. Uh, now the, the as I said I'm not a specialist in Somali areas but. If we look at Somaliland, it, it's it's pretty obvious that 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 the Somaliland project is is very much uh, it's about the corridor, it's a bar Barra port, Hargeisa, the frontier with Ethiopia, and that's uh, you know one of one of the the, the dominant clans is like uh, very important in the trade across Somaliland and into to to Ethiopia. So and and it it seems a bit and and this this current conflict in Lassanot could as Jethan Roman also has written about. I mean, you you could you can read it as one of the effects of this kind of concentration in uh, al along the corridor of of all the efforts of of, of making the state and projecting it n not into the territory, but 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 the the hops and flows of of of, of the economy. We're going to have to invite you uh, another time. You, you can the last ten minutes, so let's. let's <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, on the on the question of of the the diaspora, um, I mean it's it's there, um, and and for example in the in the in the chapter on telecommunication, it's very clear that that it's a r the rem remittance companies that that kind of develop very much on the basis on on of, of remittances and the whole uh, develop the whole telecommunication sector. Uh, very much with 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 the money from or making money from the from from the diaspora, 
and 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 also several other places where it comes it comes in, but it's not something we have like emphasized like as a there are other programs here actually who work very much on 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 the diaspora and dispor uh, diaspora uh, diasporic uh, humanitarianism and so on <coughs> but it, it's 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 i mean it it's it's a remittance uh, economy very much and that goes also into to the trade very much i i agree very much um, I would like to just comment quickly. Uh, I think the question of unmaking the state, uh, was that yours? Yeah. Um, that um, I think what we try to discuss is a broader term of taxation where we also include non-state actors, um, which is part of why taxation also unmakes the state. Because as you also mentioned, Al-Shabaab is the most effective tax collector at the moment. Um, and there, uh, we also write uh, in, in one of our uh, chapters about how their uh, collection of taxes um, unmakes the state in, in more than one way because it, it competes with the state, first of all, in, in terms of the revenue. And it takes revenue away and, and hinders uh, the traders in being able and willing to, to pay tax further taxes to the state. And on the other hand, it also competes with the state in, in terms of, obviously, al Jabab is, is uh, very much against the whole state building project. So the way when they collect taxes and use that for their own military and administrative uh, expansion, that also uh, undermines the, the state making efforts. So that was just uh, a quick explanation on how trade also unmakes the state. Just to build on that. Uh, Am I audible now? Okay, good. So to build on the question of uh, how does uh, taxation or, or make or unmake, on. sorry? I don't think it's on. Is it now? Yeah. Maybe there's no, no packet. <laughs> <laughs> you can give it to me. Okay. So, uh, sorry for that. Just to build on the, the question of how does taxation make or unmake the state, I think you, uh, we just need to understand three things. Number one is state itself. What does it mean? I mean, to different people, state means different things. Maybe what a state is to some of you, might state might be a different thing to other, to other people depending on the context, right, and the expectation, and the functions of the state. That's one thing. Also, state, where does it exist? Is it tangible, physical, or does it exist within our imaginations? Right? It's another question. So most of the time, maybe state sometimes is made or unmade within the experience and the imagination of the subjects or the citizens, right? Not even maybe physically, but maybe other times physically, right? Where you see the state and you interact with the state. Uh, that's one thing. Number two, we also need uh, to understand uh, revenue. What does it do? What's the logic? Revenue taxation has could, have, could have different logics. Maybe one logic could be legitimacy. Maybe another logic could be self-delivery. Maybe another logic could be so that we have to also understand the logic of revenue collection. What does it mean? So sometimes people pay the revenue based on the logic to build the state. Other times they pay the revenue based on the logic to get protection, and so on and so forth. The third thing we need to understand is identity. The subject is who is paying the tax? Why are they paying? What are they expecting in return? Sometimes they just pay without expecting anything, simply because they own the state. It's our state. Very good case in point is the Somaliland, taxi bears, especially from the Isaac clan, the, centr the, 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 the central clan. 
Somaliland wants to secede from the rest of Somalia. It wants independence. The state, they pay based on the logic of state building. We have to pay and contribute taxes, not expecting maybe service delivery, not expecting anything in return, but we have to build our own state so that we, become, we can become a state, so that we can, we, we, we can get recognition. So that's one thing. Then there are also other actors who are just trying to, through taxation, to unmake the state. Who are they? Non-state actors. There's a whole competition between Al-Shabaab trying to undermine the Somali state through revenue collection. There's also other examples where the Somali state is trying to re-emerge through revenue, co revenue collection. So there's a kind of contestation. That's it. I mean, it's a, definitely, a, we're not going to do justice for the questions. These are very broad and provocative questions, but just to, to th that's one thing. State. I mean, scholars of state building, they talk about different types of state. Maybe in Europe we have full states. Maybe in other contexts we have uh, what they call quasi-state. Maybe in other contexts we have fragile states, post-conflict states. So we don't have to expect, we have to also change our expectations depending on what state are we talking about. We don't have to definitely, I think it will be big injustice if we expect Somalia, maybe which is a quasi-state, maybe which is post-conflict state, which is also a fragile state. If we expect Somalia to behave uh, as similar to other European more established states, maybe that can be a bit of injustice. So sometimes we have to also understand what type of state are we talking about, in which context. Context matters, right? And then uh, the, finally the question on diaspora. Somali economy or Somali trading can be categorized into three. Import economy, export economy, and service, service economy. Fortunately or unfortunately, for some reasons, the diaspora are not very much dominant in the import-export economy. They are very much dominant in the surface, in the surface economy, especially in the at, 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 at the, uh, not at the highest scale. Why are they absent? It's, a, it's another question. Do they play a role in the state making? Abs of, the, of course they do. But in this particular research, all researchers were, may, were focused on the uh, bundles, economic goods, goods. So, and the diaspora are not very much represented in the trade of import and export goods. I think, uh, mm. yep, thank you very much. I've tried. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's <clears throat> a couple of minutes, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to engage with the book, and I see a couple of burning, burning questions. I have uh, one question over there, and then one question over there. Please introduce yourself. Keep it short, please. Um, hi, my name is Christoph. Um, long shot, but quick question. Um, I recently read, I look forward to reading that book, but I recently read another book I found very fantastic, which is called World Making After Empire by a political theorist called Adam Getashev. And it's, in two words, it's uh, tracing the political tradition of anti-colonial struggles and possibilities of, of emancipation and how that was a possibility in the 50s and 60s with people from Nkrumah to CLR James across the ocean, but then also how it fell ultimately apart, not necessarily because of politics, but because of sort of the new international economic order and neoliberalism. And I was wondering if you have a few words to say of how you would contextualize this kind of friction in the context of trade making states in Somalia that is that can be seen either as a sort of dystopia perhaps with sort of things breaking down and the war in the 90s and so on and so forth but also perhaps in a twisted way a kind of utopia where in the end there is some kind of autarky and self-sufficiency and sort of a, a model that defies actually uh, colonial and post-colonial um, imperialism um, in that context. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, my name is Abdurrahman, a PhD student from University of Nairobi and University of Copenhagen. So uh, a lot has been said about making and unmaking of the state. My question is uh, quite different in that uh, it is focuses on uh, the obstacles the state is making, is facing in remaking state itself. So the traders themselves 
not the thread. The threaders are in a way, uh, according to uh, how I understand, uh, in competition with the state in that uh, they also fight the state not to stand on its own feet. Uh, and a good example is the way you mentioned about Hormuz and uh, national corporations who have uh, interest at the stake in like uh, they are in custody of the, uh, the country code. Uh, they have been running monopoly in this business. Uh, they also act like uh, the central bank of the country because they are handling all the, uh, you know, ca the, 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 the savings of, of the citizens. And in that, uh, a lot discussion is going within the Somalis that they are not willing to give up uh, any chance to stay to form because they will lose a lot and they will be regulated. And a good example has been Hassan Sheikh, the president, who gave a lecture last week where he was lamenting and complaining that the traders are not ready to give a tax to the government. An example he mentioned himself is that uh, a bulletproof car that cost 180000 is taxed only five thousand dollars, and he was, you know, like, uh, uh, like blaming the traders who are importing these uh, commodities. They are not ready and willing to give tax to the government, and maybe it is a conspiracy they are making as uh, many things. What do you say about that in your book? Um. To address the last question first, um, I'm not sure how much we touch upon the issue of economic spoilers uh, in this book. I know it's not something in, in the chapters that I've been part of that we have uh, discussed very much. Uh, but I think it's definitely, you're absolutely right, it's a very big issue. And what we do uh, discuss is um, the way that larger traders and larger businesses like the Hawalas, like the telecom, and and they have much more leverage uh, to be able to negotiate the tax e exemptions and being able to avoid paying any taxes and, and contributing their part, which would be much larger than a lot of the small traders that can do nothing uh, about uh, the taxes that they have to pay on a monthly and yearly basis. Um, so that's definitely, uh, I think, an important issue to to discuss, and uh, that that you have these very large uh, economic actors that are generally not contributing uh, any taxes at all. Uh, I think that's that's a very good point. Um. What? Oh, sorry. So I think uh, on the question of uh, do the, I mean, in this discussion of uh, making and making the state and the the role of Somali uh, business business leaders, and one question is do Somali major, b of course, also when talking about Somali business people, we have to understand what uh, what level we're talking about. Major corporation is, I mean, small traders or medium traders. Small traders, medium traders are just like any other traders. They, they don't have much influence. They don't have much uh, political ambitions. They just do uh, trading activities uh, for livelihoods. However, we have uh, the major major corporations, or the I mean, whether exporters, importers, financial, uh, in, uh, those actors in the financial industry, uh, telecommunication industry, and so on and so forth. Definitely. They have a role in state making or unmaking. One question is, do they want a state to re-emerge at all in Somalia? Of course, some of them maybe they don't don't want, but as I, far as I know, many of them want the state to re-emerge. Why do they want? They just need protection. Because most of the time, they also need services, like the, the, the banking services, the financial services. Many of these major, major, major Somali traders, they normally uh, keep their money in Djibouti and Dubai. So they need the, the banks. If they have to, if, if they want to remit to to send the money to China or to India or to any country to import, they always face challenges and difficulties. So they want a state that can facilitate the the follow the follow of money. They all sometimes they face uh, I mean I mean I mean other challenges because of. Uh, I mean, being in a stateless context, so they need a protection. 
They also need protection from other non-state actors like Al-Shabaab. Good. But the question is, another question is, what type of state do they want? They want a type of state that serves for them. That's not a predator to them. And they have a very bad experience with the state. It started from the colonial state, post the colonial state, and the dictator from 1969 to 90. So they have a bad experience with the state. Based on that bad experience, they don't want a very strong predatory extortionist state. They just want a state that does not uh, that facilitates their trade activity, but that's also that's not also a predatory. That's one thing. Uh, absolutely, sometimes they just try. There's a whole uh, the Somali state building involves a lot of a lot of I mean a lot of uh, negotiation. Sometimes they just refuse to pay taxes. Sometimes now the state is reimagining, and the state is trying to reclaim some of its rights, including service delivery. Because now everything is somebody is privatized: education, healthy land, everything is privatized, and the state has nothing. So the state wants to reclaim, but they don't want to give it back easily. It's a whole process of negotiation. So I mean, but this is the context. The context. In which we need to understand this kind of the role of uh, major major corporations in making and making of the state. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot <coughs> to 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 add. Um, I think on on the on the on the kind of corporate sector, the the business sector, I mean, they have been very much in. Uh, one of the ways they have supported state building is by giving loans and helping establish a national currency and stuff like that. <coughs> but it's on um, expecting in return to have tax exemptions and to have influence on political matters that, that are central to them. So that, that's very clear. And that's, but it's not something, yeah, it's, I mean, it's there, but it's not something we have <coughs> focused a lot on. Uh, I know Ahmed's work is very much on the oligopi oli oligopolies and, and so on, on in, in Somaliland and elsewhere. Um, <coughs> on the, on the, yeah, your, your, your question on neoliberalism and so on. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, as I said, I'm not a specialist on, on Somali history and that. I'm, I, there was a connection. But I, I, what I would like to mention is that <coughs> still now, I mean, the, the, the neoliberalist agenda in terms of, of free trade and, and lowering customs and <coughs> ensuring transit agreements and so on, they're very much pushing I mean, that's very much a neoliberal agenda, and, and that for, for Somaliland, for example, we're now negotiating the, the, the Barbara Corridor and, 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 and a, a transit agreement with Ethiopia. I mean, one of the things is that, that, that when that uh, starts working, <coughs> the Somaliland state will, will miss out on the customs for the large part of imports that go through, that are re-exported to, to Ethiopia, basically. Now half of it is like smuggled into into Ethiopia in, in a way, but <coughs> but um, but but so so the idea is that that okay we'll we'll lose out on the customs, but then they will try to broaden the the revenue base and have more direct taxes, and also expect that there will be more economic activity overall that can generate you know more revenues along the way and so on. So so in that sense, uh, th it's uh, it's definitely. Uh, a neoliberal agenda still working there. Um, on on the on the businesses. Final words. Last words. Um, no, the, the, that that they kind of also expect that that compet competition is kept out. Um, and it's interesting, for example, in the telecom uh, sector, that there's there's no for I mean the the big South African companies are not present in Somalia, for example. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Let's join with warm applause for the team. <laughs> if my job was uh, timekeeping, my only job was timekeeping, I did a terrible job, so I was very, very sorry about that. We welcome you for uh, a refreshment and a snack in the uh, lounge. Thanks. <laughs>